honor of all of the Jaws movies being on Netflix right now, we're talking about Jaws. And here's the thing. I thought that doing Jaws would be pretty easy. I mean, the first film was one of my favorite films of all time. And I've seen it so many damn times that I figured that this would be a swim in the pond. But as it turns out, the pond is pretty damn deep. It contains a 25-foot great white shark. The first film was released in 1975 and is considered to be the very first summer blockbuster, becoming the highest grossing film of all time until it was dethroned by Star Wars a few years later. Since the film never states the year in which it takes place, and in fact, none of the movies do, we are assuming that it takes place in the year of its release, 1975. One of the key factors of the timeline of the films is determining the age of the Brody children since they're in all of them. Using information from the second film, we're going to calculate Michael to be about 13 years old in this one, and we'll talk more about that later. But there's never really any indication of Sean's age. Because of that, we use the actual age of the actor playing the character at the time, which makes him seven years old. We learn that this is Martin Brody's first summer as chief of police in Amity, which, as you know, means friendship. And no one believes him when he thinks that a shark is attacking because, well, tourism. Although the town has never seen a single murder, it is about to see a great white shark eat a girl, a dog, the Kittner kid, Ben Gardner, and a fisherman. A quick note here is that Michael Brody is the only character to have a face-to-face -face encounter with the shark in every movie, and in this one it happens in the pond as the shark swims right past him after eating a fisherman, while Lil Sean plays on the beach. Anyway, Martin teams up with a marine biologist named Hooper and a shark hunter named Quint, and they all head out to sea to kill a big fish. They have a series of close encounters before the final confrontation, where Hooper is forced to hide on the ocean floor, Quint is eaten, and the orca is destroyed. Brody faces off with the big guy, shoving a pressurized scuba tank into his mouth, and after spouting his one-liner of, Smile, you son of a bitch, he shoots the tank and explodes the shark into red bits as it slowly sinks to the bottom. The second film picks up some time later and starts off by letting us know that there's a new shark on the loose by having him eat a few scuba divers by the wreckage of the orca. And then, for good measures, he eats a water skier, and then attacks a boat, getting his face burned in the process, distinguishing it from the shark in the first movie. Which 25-foot shark do you mean? Oh, the one that looks like Two-Face. After a dead killer whale washes up on shore, presumably not the one from the movie Orca, Martin suspects that another shark is on the loose. Of course, no one believes him again because, well, tourism. And he's fired from his job. Here's where we get our time frame, as he states that losing the job is four years down the drain. Since the first movie was his first season as chief, that places this as four years after the first movie, setting in 1979. Since they also state that Michael is 17 years old while discussing him getting a job, we get the source of his age in the first movie. And for Sean, we're again going to use the actor in the first film as seven, and that'll make him 11 in, in this one. So Michael and Sean head out to sea for an adventure with friends, which quickly turns into a stalker film with the shark attacking their group. Michael gets another face-to-face -face encounter with the shark when he's pulled out of the water just in time by his friends. And meanwhile, the shark almost kills more scuba divers. It eats Eddie here, kills poor Marge right in front of Lil Sean, and it eats a whole goddamn helicopter and its pilot. Brody shows up just in time to pull up on a huge electrical cable and shout a new one-liner, it's say ah this time, and the shark gets electrocuted and kind of blows up and it slowly sinks to the bottom. It's interesting to note that this movie is exactly half as good as the first one, with a quality drop of 50%. So now we come to the third one, and it's in 3D, and I don't mean 3D like they have today, where it looks like layers of imagery in a three-dimensional space. It's 3D like they constantly poke stuff at the camera to make it look like it's coming out at you. Anyway, right off the bat, we're told that the movie is suggested by the novel by Peter Benchley, which makes me think of the book calling the producers and saying, hey, Set this one at SeaWorld. Oh, hey book, that's a good idea. Thanks for the suggestion. Any others? Yeah, get Roy Shutter back. We tried book, he was a hard pass. Oh, okay, then just use the Brody kids. Okay book, but they're grown up now. And Michael is, he's totally grown up and he's now played by Dennis Quaid and he's now an engineer at SeaWorld and works alongside his girlfriend Kay. Sean shows up and he's just graduated college and he quickly hooks up with Leah Thompson who also works at the park. So since Sean is graduating college, that most likely puts him around 22 years old. So we're about 11 years from Jaws 2, and that makes this one take place around 1990. Although it came out in 1983, and that totally doesn't make sense with the technology in this one. Regardless, a new shark shows up and immediately starts eating. It gets a park mechanic, and then moves on to a couple of coral thieves. All those, those 
pesky coral thieves. Turns out that there's a smaller baby shark that Michael and Kay capture and put into captivity, and then Lou Gossett Jr. kind of kills it. Although Kay realizes that the little shark couldn't have been the culprit, they refuse to shut down the park because, well, tourism. This apparently pisses off the mother shark who proceeds to attack the entire park. And this one is a bit different as it's 35 feet long and also a complete and total failure doing shark. It pops up in the lagoon directly behind a group of water skiers and they all fall into the water but she isn't able to eat any of them. And it then moves on to the bumper boat zone where Sean and Leah are having fun and it literally comes up right between them and only manages to cut Leah's leg and then leaves. Anyway, a bunch of people are trapped in an underground attraction, so Mike has to save them all, including this guy whose shirt says, let a gargoyle sit on your face. It says that. I wouldn't lie. Uh, he has the help of a Steve Irwin wannabe who leads the shark into a large pipe, only to get himself swallowed whole, and I guess crushed to death inside the shark's mouth? I don't know. Mike and Kay free the people just before the sharks get loose, but they're saved by the park's dolphins. And in yet another episode of Total Ineptitude, one of the dolphins basically puts itself directly in the shark's mouth, but still shows up unharmed in the end because shark can't shark. It smashes the control room and then eats Lou Goss as his nephew stunt dummy. Uh, somehow, even after eating that guy, the Steve Irwin guy is somehow still right up in front of his mouth and he's holding a convenient grenade. Mike gets his third close-up personal shark moment and manages to pull the pin, blowing up the shark sans one-liner, and it slowly sinks to the bottom. The movie ends on this magical freeze frame as well. Uh, this one once again drops exactly 50% in quality from the previous one, making it only about 25% as good as the original. So the fourth movie takes an interesting turn. We're reintroduced to Ellen Brody, and Sean Brody is now a deputy in Amity, following in the footsteps of his now deceased father who passed away from a heart attack. Just before Christmas, Sean is eaten by a new giant shark. And at his funeral, we meet Michael, now played by Lance Guest. Since it's revealed that he's now a marine biologist getting his PhD with a shaky marriage and a five-year-old girl, and there's no mention of K or SeaWorld, we can safely assume that this takes place in a separate universe than part three, factoring in college, getting his master's, beginning to work on his doctorate. We can probably assume that this also takes place um, with the five-year-old girl in there, let's say about 11 years again after Jaws 2, making this one also set in 1990, which makes a little bit more sense as this film was released in 1987. Anyway, after Sean's funeral, Ellen goes with Michael to the Bahamas and the shark follows them and apparently arrives at basically the same time as them, even though they flew there. You see, there's a vague hinting that there's some sort of supernatural element to the shark this time around because it can, I guess, teleport, and it only seems really interested in eating Brody's. That, that being said, for about three quarters of this movie, the shark doesn't eat anybody or do much of anything until the last 15 minutes or so when it finally attacks and accidentally eats this random lady while trying to get the little girl. It also apparently gains the power to sort of float on top of the water, I guess. So this prompts Ellen to force a confrontation with the shark, where the shark manages to somehow miss eating Michael Caine because this shark is about as competent as the one from part three. It also bites Mario Van Peebles and depending upon which version you saw, kills him, but not before he drops this EMP device in his belly. The device drives the shark crazy, making it defy physics and pop all the way out of the water and incidentally roar like a dinosaur. Ellen doesn't give a one-liner, but she does have a flashback to an event that she wasn't present for, in which Martin does it for her, and then she impales the shark with the front of the boat. Now, depending upon which version you've seen, this either causes the shark to explode or just sink slowly to the bottom. And I mean, it, it sinks slowly to the bottom in either version, it's just that one version has a shark more than in one piece, and with a slightly larger shred of logic. I mean, I mean, what, did the shark have cartoon nitroglycerin in for blood? This one is not only dreadfully dull and ridiculous, but also once again drops exactly 50% in quality from the previous, meaning that it is a mere 12.5% as good as the first movie. So there it is, it was a little bit harder than I thought, and I have to admit I did kind of forget that the fourth movie ignores that the third one existed, but I didn't forget just how bad that the later ones were, so I at least was prepared for that. So if you have any comments, please make it down below. Um, please also subscribe to the videos if you enjoy them. I've got some more videos coming up. Uh, Halloween will be done just in time for Halloween. Uh, Hellraiser is on its way, I know a lot of people have been requesting those, but uh, we've got a nice little surprise coming up for you first before then. So I'll see you in a couple weeks, and thanks for watching.